19 through 21. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy all that all where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasures is, there is your heart will also, will be also. It's good to be home. I had a great trip to Louisiana. It's the first time I've ever preached in the state of Louisiana, and I really enjoyed my time there, meeting the folks. Uh, it's not anything like that you might imagine. Uh, where I was was about an hour north, I mean hour, about a half hour north of Shreveport, uh, up in the far northwest corner of the state. Uh, in fact, on Monday night, I think I may have mentioned this in the bulletin, on Monday night, there were people in the audience from Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas, and nobody had driven more than a half hour or so to be there. I mean, that gives you an idea where it is. And then this little factoid that my, my good friend, the preacher there, is the only guy that I knew when I went, Adam Miller. And Adam said, he goes, I'm going to tell you something that's, that you're not going to believe it, but it's true. I said, all right, lay it on me. He said, you're as close to New Orleans in Hamilton, Alabama, as you are right now. I said, man, that ain't no way. In, in my mind, I didn't call him a liar, you know. But in my mind, I'm like, there's no way I'm as close to New Orleans, at Hamilton, as I am in Shreve, near Shreveport, Louisiana. Five and a half hours to New Orleans from a little town called Plain Dealey. Ain't no good way to get to New Orleans. You know, New Orleans is in the far southeast end, and Plain Dealey's up in the northwest end, and you can get to New Orleans about as fast from right here as you can from there. And I thought, man... So I don't know why I would be surprised uh, at such a thing because, you know, you can drive to my hometown in Dexter, Missouri, and sometimes you can drive to Rhonda's hometown in South County, St. Louis, as fast as you can drive to Gulf Shores from here. And nobody would think about being as close to St. Louis from here as you would be from Gulf Shores. But it's a fact. And so, uh, so I, I got a little geography lesson while I was down there, and I got another lesson that was quite helpful, and that is that not everybody in Louisiana talks like Troy Landry. You know, I found that quite refreshing. I even told the brethren that. I said, I've been pleasantly surprised that I got there. I said, y'all talk just like I do. Just like I said, ain't none of that, that Cajun mumbling that nobody can understand. I said, y'all actually speak in plain good old Southern English. They all laugh because they all understand that, that, that there's this, there's this uh, uh, misconception that everybody, you know, that everybody in Louisiana belongs on swamp people. And it's just not so. Uh, in fact, I went fishing on Monday and I didn't see the first gator. Now they said there's gators in the lake, but I didn't, I didn't see any. We went fishing for about four hours Monday morning. But, uh, but uh, these, these are just good, look, just good old cattle farmers and dirt farmers, just like we are here. Uh, the, lay, the lay of the land is very similar. A uh, lot of logging right in there, and I really enjoyed being with those people, and they were very, very encouraging. Uh, one of the elders there, Bill Boyd, gave me an armadillo trap. It's in the back of my truck. I need to show it to you. Uh, it's got trap doors on each side. He built it with his own hands, and it's an interesting contraption. I showed it to Kyle uh, the other night, Friday night, but uh, uh, I got an armadillo trap, and, and if you have problems, I might be willing to rent it. <laughs> but uh, just uh, had a great, a, a great trip, uh, but I'm, I'm always happy, always happy to be at home, and as I always say, to be with my, to be with my people. You know, the human heart is a marvel of God's wisdom. Your heart will beat 100,000 times between right now and this time tomorrow. 100,000 times. Your heart will beat 35 million times between right now and this time next year. 
And if you live a normal lifespan and have a normal heart rate, your heart will beat 2.5 billion times from the time that your heart begins to beat in your mother's womb until it beats for the last time during your earthly sojourn. The heart is a marvel of the wisdom of God. And your heart, as you probably learned in, in junior high or high school biology or physiology, your heart is composed of four different chambers. And each of those chambers has a different function. For example, the upper right chamber is the right atrium. And the right atrium receives the oxygen-depleted blood from your body and pumps it into your right ventricle. And then your right ventricle pumps that blood into your lungs. And then from your lungs, the blood comes into the left atrium, your oxygen, what's called your oxygen-rich blood, which pumps into the left ventricle, which then pumps the blood to your body. It's an, it's an incredible piece of machinery, if, if I can use that terminology. But as we all know, any interruption of that process can lead to big problems, even death. Especially if you have, and Dennis, stand out here so I, can, I know you're going to know this. If you have any type of blockage in your left anterior or your lower anterior artery, if you have a blockage there, it's especially bad. And that one is so bad that it's what artery? That artery's got its own name. And I took it off your, off your sheet so you wouldn't cheat. I saw Jennifer, she just said it. She mouthed it. That, that artery has its own name. And what is it? Widowmaker. That's right. That artery is so important, they call it the Widowmaker. And if you have a heart attack, outside of a hospital in the Widowmaker artery, you have a 1 in 8 chance to survive. 88% of people who have Widowmaker heart attacks die. 88% die. Now, man also has a spiritual heart. The Bible talks about the spiritual heart. I had Ethan read, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, well, but Ethan, when he was reading, he wasn't talking about this, was he? He was talking about our spiritual heart. If you see on the top of your handout, it says, How can you say I love you if your heart is not with me? Now, by the way, that statement is true, right? How can you say I love you if your heart is not with me? But did you know that one of the sorriest people that ever lived said it? I'm going to drop a name on you. Delilah. Delilah. A name, a name that has forever lived in infamy. Although I didn't know a girl or meet a girl named Delilah one time in Halo. I thought, man, her mother either doesn't know anything about the Bible or she didn't like her or something. You know. But I have met one Delilah and zero Jezebels, all right? But but that's the that's the person who made that statement. She said that to Samson because Samson would never tell her the source of his strength. And she says, You continually mock me. How can you say I love you if your heart is not with me? And that's a true statement. It was not only true in that sense, it is also true in a religious sense. You know, Jesus said, how can you call me Lord, Lord, and what? Do not do the things that I say. He says, he who loves me is he who keeps my commandments. And so we learn, we learn that there is, a, there is a spiritual heart that all of us possess. And I think it would be safe for us to say that our spiritual heart also has four compartments. 
And that those four things work together in a particular order. As, as we know, you know, right or you know, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. That's the that's the cycle. And, and and our heart, our spiritual heart, has a similar cycle. And there are there are well, for our study this morning, we'll look at four aspects of our spiritual heart. We we'll begin first of all looking at the intellectual part of the heart. Secondly, we will look at the emotional part of the heart. Number three, we will look at the motivational part of our heart, spiritual heart. And finally, we will look at the volitional part of our spiritual heart. And just by way of definition, the intellectual part of our heart is that which challenges the mind. The intellect, our thinking, that is the intellectual. In other words, that Bible teaching that challenges the way that we think. And then there is the emotional part of our heart. And I call this the part that churns the spirit, churns us in the inner man. Paul was preaching in a place one time, and the Bible said his heart was stirred within him. And he testified that Jesus was the Christ. No, there was an inner stirring, an emotional response of, in his heart. And then thirdly, there is that motivational part of the heart that tells me that there is something that must be done. Based on the intellect, based on the emotion, then there is the, there is the challenge of the motivation. What is there to be done? In other words, there is a call to action. And then finally, there's this, the volitional part of our heart, which is the, the courage to change. The courage to change. And I will submit for you, to you, that just like any interruption in your physical heart, disruption or interruption of the, of the flow in your physical heart can be extremely dangerous even deadly, that the same applies also to our spiritual heart. That if there's any interruption between point one and point four, that there's also going to be a serious problem, even spiritual death, if this is not corrected. Let's begin first of all by thinking about the intellect, the intellectual part of our heart, that which challenges the mind. In Proverbs 23 and verse number 7, although I think I'm probably using this passage a little bit out of context because about 99 out of 5 people do, is that it says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Now that's a true statement, generally speaking, but that's not what the writer of Proverbs is trying to get across. But nevertheless, it is a truism. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. In Mark chapter 2, and in verse number 8, as Jesus was talking to that paralytic, you remember the, 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 where, where they brought the man that was paralyzed, and they dropped him down through the roof, and Jesus, seeing their faith, said to that man, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. And then the Bible says, they that heard that said, this man's a blasphemer. Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you reason in your heart? Reason. That word there is the word from which we get our English word logic. Logic. And by the way, let's just be, let's be clear on this. Those men were not wrong in their initial assessment of Jesus. You know, because you know, we get to come, we get to come to every story about Jesus from the Google Maps view, right? I mean, we get to see the whole timeline from from front to back. You know, from his virgin birth and all the strife there. You know, or, or anything that he did. We get to see, we already know the whole picture, right? And sometimes we forget to put ourselves in the place where those people were. 
Just a quick example. Everybody in the world believed that Mary had stepped out on Joseph, right? When Mary went off to Elizabeth, engaged to Joseph, and comes back three months later pregnant, you tell me what everybody thought. Tell me what you would have thought. And you would have been right, <laughs> except in this case. And so what, and what it's not, a, in, in this case, when they said, this man's a blasphemer because nobody can forgive sins but God, that was a logical conclusion. It was a reasonable conclusion. Now look, Jesus went on to dispel their misunderstanding, right? But it was, it was intellectually not feasible for Jesus to forgive sins until they understood who he was. And so there's the part of the heart that reasons, that, that, that adds things up, that puts things together. And, and, and what comes out of this intellect is what I do. Now, whatever comes out of, of my intellect is, is who I am and what I do. For example, in Matthew 15 and verse 9, Jesus said, you know, out of the heart proceeds you know, adulteries and all of these sins. In other words, it's not what comes into a man's mouth that defiles him. It's what comes out of his mouth that defiles him because what comes out of his mouth originates in his heart or in his, his intellect. And so this is why repentance is ultimately rooted in the intellect. It's rooted in the mind. Because the word repentance doesn't, and by the way, I've said this, I know I've said this a thousand times. At least a thousand times since I've been here. Repentance is not changing the way you live. Repentance is changing the way you think. Which leads to a change of the way that you live. You know, in Matthew chapter 3, John told the Pharisees, Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. See, they came to be baptized by John, but they didn't no more believe in John's baptism than a man on the moon. They're just covering their bases. Either that or trying to appeal to the massive numbers of people that are coming to John. And John's like, no, you can't, you can't submit to this baptism until you change the way you think. That's what repentance is. Have you ever heard, have you ever heard it said of somebody, all he or she needs to do is be baptized? Have you ever heard somebody say that? Have you ever thought that? They're such a good person. They do this, 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 and this. But 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 they, they're just not, they've not been, if, if they could just be baptized, everything would be okay. And that is as wrong as it can be. People who refuse to be baptized need to repent. They need to change the way that they think. Because the way that they think is what is hindering them from being baptized like the Bible teaches. Man, man, I'm just, I, I just look over here at Woodard and I'm just like, man, there's a guy that, that changed the way he was thinking. Bill ain't totally right. No, I, I, you ain't never going to be totally right. <laughs> but man, I remember it, dude. March the 31st, 2013. Sitting in that office, you know, and, and just talking and just see, man, here's a guy that, here's a guy that's ready to make a change. And he understands that he's, going to, that he's going to have to think different than he, than he used to think. That's what repentance is. Then repentance produces the attitude that says, now I'm going to obey God and I'm going to do what God has told me to do in the pages of, of Holy Scripture. But repentance is not changing the way you live. It's changing the way you think. And you can't change the way that you live until you change the way that you think. You know, in Acts chapter 8 and verses 18 to 22, Simon the sorcerer wanted to buy the gift that the apostles had. Do you remember that? Give me also this, you know, offer the money. Give me also this gift. 
That on whom I lay my hands, they'll also receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter said, your money perish with you. He says, your heart is not right with God. That's why I led the song that I led before the sermon. Is thy heart right with God? He said, your heart is not right. Repent and pray to God that perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. See, there's the intellectual part of the heart. Then it is the, from the intellectual part that gives birth to the emotional part of the heart. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4, uh, and verse 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. What, what, you know, what Jesus is talking about here is essentially the steps to, matu to spiritual maturity. In other words, you, you are poor in spirit. You don't think of yourself the way that you used to. You think of yourself the way that God wants you to think about yourself. And then when, we, when I do that, then my heart hurts. When I realize I've not been thinking properly, when that's brought to the forefront of my mind, then my heart hurts. You know, there's an interesting phrase in 1 Peter 1 and verse 22 that, that I've never considered because I hadn't looked at the language that, that's in it. But in, uh, in 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, uh, uh, Peter says, Seeing then you have purified your souls by obeying the truth through the Spirit unto lo unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. That phrase, unto, seeing that you have purified your souls by obeying the truth unto, through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Unto is the word ace. It's the word in Acts 2.38. Be re you know, repent, be baptized for the remission of sin. What Peter is saying here, it, at least in part, is, is that you obey because you desired the love of good brethren. Unto, unto, you obeyed the truth. You purified your soul by obeying the truth because you desired the unhypocritical love of the brethren. And so Peter says, keep on loving one another with a pure heart fervently. Have we ever thought about or given consideration to the fact? And look, and I'm going to throw a verse at you here in just a minute, and you all know it. But have you ever thought about what it means for people to see genuine love in a church? You know, we talk about, you know, I talk about y'all, I call y'all my people, right? You're my people. What do I mean by that? I mean, you're the most important people to me on the earth. You're my brethren. You know, no, we, have, you know, we share a bond that does not exist anywhere to any degree in any comparison to that which is outside the church. The bond that we have in this body exceeds any physical or earthly relationship. That's why Jesus said, and here's the verse I said I was going to drop on you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus knew how important it was for brethren to love one another. The writer of Hebrews closed out that final chapter with chapter 13, verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. How many people in this world have never seen genuine love? They were raised in, 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 in households that were, were a train wreck wrapped up in a dumpster fire. 
You know, they they live they live at the they work in a place where everybody's just stabbing one another in the back trying to get ahead. You know, there's gossip and there's innuendo and insinuations and and and, and, and outright lies. I mean, you think about the world that most of the that most of the people in this world live in. And by the way, to some extent, we live in that world, but we know that when we walk through those doors, there's a respite. This is a place of peace and calm and harmony and love and reassurance. And Peter says, people desire that. And they need to see it in us. And when they see it in us, they'll want to be like us. They'll want to be a part of that. That's why people in many in cases are attracted to the church because they see the love. In other words, the intellect is all it is uh, uh, the intellect spurs on the emotional. But then there's part number three, and that's the motivational part, the call. The heart is moved to do something. You know, in Acts 2 and verse 36, Peter preaches. And by the way, if you want to, you can go ahead and turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2 because we're going to walk through that chapter in just a minute as we draw this thing to a close. But you know, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 36, Peter says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And then here comes the motivation. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Motivated. And sometimes people can be motivated in a bad way. Because Stephen preached the same gospel in Acts chapter 7, and the Bible, using a different term, said when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They weren't pricked in their heart, they were cut to the heart. And their response to what Stephen had to say was vastly different than the response that those people had to what Peter had to say. But nevertheless, both groups were motivated. They were motivated. Peter's group to do what's right. Stephen's group to silence this one who had condemned them of the murder of the son of God. The difference between pricked in the heart and being cut to the heart. And then there's this. Once we are motivated, there is the volitional part. The volitional part of the human heart or the spiritual heart. Notice, there has to be a decision to obey. The volition means of your own free will. You choose to do a thing. You choose to do a thing. You know, in Jeremiah 29, and verse 13, Jeremiah said, You will seek me, and you will find me when you search for me with your whole heart. Volition. Jeremiah 24, and verse 7, he said, Then my people shall return to me with their whole heart. And then a passage that we have spent a lot of time studying on Wednesday nights. Romans 6 and verse 17. But God be thanked that when you were the servants of sin, you obeyed from the heart. Volition. You obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Now, I want you to see all four of these things brought together on the day of Pentecost. Dealing first with the intellect, that which challenges the mind. The Holy Spirit descends on the apostles. They all begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This thing gets noised abroad, and these people are all, they're gathered around them. It says the multitude was confused because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they said, how is it that we hear every man speak in his own language wherein we were born? And some of them said, these men are drunk. But Peter said, these men are not drunk. As you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. He's like, think for a minute. It's nine o'clock in the morning. He's appealing to the intellect. 
But this is that which was spoken by Joel. So you got verses 12 through 20 where Peter appeals to the intellect that what you used to read or what you read in Joel 2 is what you're seeing right now. And then he appeals more to the intellect with Christ. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in your midst as ye yourselves also know. He pointed to Jesus and reminded them of everything that Jesus had done. Don't try to act like you don't know who Jesus is and don't try to act like you don't know what he has done. And then he appealed to their intellect in regard to David, beginning in verse 29. And then he comes all the way back around to Jesus. He says, this Jesus God has exalted to his right hand. This Jesus, God has raised from the dead, and we're witnesses to it, appealing to the intellect. God has made this same Jesus both Lord and Christ. He repeatedly appealed to the facts of the case. Then what was the response? The response was a belief motivated by an emotional response, right? When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. There's the emotional response. The mind was convinced. The heart was churned. The heart was moved. Then there was the call. What shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you, your children, all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words, he both exhorted and testified, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. There's the call. Save yourselves. Be saved. The motivation. But then there's the volition. Peter couldn't make them obey. He couldn't coerce them into obedience. They had to respond of their own free will. Did, have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed that it says, "Then they that gladly received his word were baptized." <laughs> Not everybody that received his word was baptized. Not everybody that heard Peter preach that sermon was baptized. Only those who had the courage to change, the courage to act, they that gladly received his word were baptized. And there were added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. And then at the end of the chapter it says that the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. In other words, those who were hearing that message, being provoked thereby, receiving the call, with the volition exercising their own free will to change the way that they live and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. All four aspects of the spiritual heart are clearly delineated right here in Acts chapter 2. And how it works for them then is how it works for us today. It works the same way for us today. That we have to be convinced that what the Bible says is true. What the Bible says is true. Jesus said, except you believe that I am, you will die in your sins, John 8, 24. Jesus said, if we don't repent, change the way we think, we will perish, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Jesus said, whoever confesses me before men, I'll confess him before my Father in heaven, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Jesus said we got to hear the gospel, believe the gospel, and be baptized in response to the gospel in order to be saved, Mark 16, 15, and 16. And people who do not do that are not convinced that those things are true. They, they have not enjoined it. They have not allowed it to be enjoined in their mind that these things are true. And then allow them to motivate them to churn their heart and to or to, to churn their heart and motivate them to act. But I can assure you those things are true. Those things are true. One must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of his sins, confess that Jesus is the Lord, 
and be buried in the waters of baptism to receive the remission of sins. Those things are true. Those are facts. We allow the facts to motivate you, to, to move you, to move your heart, to prick your heart, and to, and to, and to cause you to, be want, to move from where you are to another place. It is also true that we must walk in the light. 1 John 1 verse 7. If we, if, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. That is true. But many Christians act like it is not true. Because they, they make very little effort to walk in the light each and every day of their life. But rest assured, those things are true. And this final thing is also true for the child, child of God. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How can you say you love me if your heart is not with me? I'll tell you one thing. If there is any interruption in your spiritual heart, you have less of a chance to survive than you do a wooden maker. You got a one in eight chance to survive a winter maker heart attack, but if you don't allow God to work on your heart and follow the precepts that are found therein, you have a zero chance of survival. Spiritual death is the only thing that awaits unless you are willing to make the corrections. We're going to sing the first verse of number 214, trust and obey. And if you're here this morning and you need to respond in some way to the Lord's invitation to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins or be restored to a proper relationship with Him, then we invite you and we plead with you to come. Right now, together we stand and sing this song together.